Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm uh, just thrilled to have our guest today. It's Irene Hardwick Olivieri. And uh, before we get started, I want to remind everybody to like and subscribe. Plus, you can um, see all the videos from our shows at youtube.com slash film talk radio. And uh, we'll jump right into it. Irene, hey, hey there. Hi, hi, happy to be here. So you've got a show. It opens at Evoke Contemporary on May 27th. It's called Seduction by Centipede. And uh, there's more, uh, there's a double entendre to the title there. Yeah, I, I, I'm super excited about this show and I'm happy to be on your show because I really enjoy listening. And I used to be really shy to talk about my work. And then I realized when I would hear interviews with other people, something would like spark my excitement. And I thought I have to lose my shyness because even if just one person gets a little something, it's a good thing to do. So thanks for inviting me on. So I'm gonna turn this because um, this is a painting that kind of I started doing. I, I, I got really interested in centipedes because I started finding a couple of dead ones and reading about them. And I just, I couldn't believe how interesting they are. Like they're, we, most people just think of them as being this venomous creature that's gonna hurt you, but their venom is really prized. It's actually way stronger than morphine for pain relief. So they bottle it up. There's this company in North Carolina, you can order it on PayPal. You can order like centipede venom and it works wonders for all kinds of health problems. But also I've always loved things that scare me. I grew up in South Texas on the border of Mexico and I, my dad was a farmer. So I was always collecting like spiders and strange things like that. But, but I um, like, usually I've ended up in the past with different boyfriends and now my husband who don't love those things. And so I was thinking how, when you're when you're in a relationship, everybody has their own things that they love or idiosyncrasies and how um, I just thought it would be funny to do a painting um, where, where there's a bed up in the saguaro trees and there's a little ladder at the bottom and the men are lining up and he, he's climbed up the ladder and he's like braving the, all the girls who have centipedes and rattlesnakes. And so they're showing him like it's sort of a way of seducing him. Is he brave enough? Is it going to be a healing? Is it going to be a seduction? Is he going to maybe die? You never know. There's Gila monsters in the cages. And so I was thinking about that title when they asked me to title the show. And I thought seduction by centipede, because that's kind of how I feel about the wilderness and all things wild. I've always been, since I was a little kid, totally fascinated with things that are that are wild and scary and black widow spiders and things like that, that you're afraid of, but you're also attracted to in some interesting way. And so, so seduction by centipede is really kind of being seduced by the natural world, by the wild parts of it that are really untamable. And it's, it's at Evoke on May the 27th. So uh, anybody who's in the area, please do check out seduction by centipede. I, I love that title. It's so compelling. Um, should, do you want to say anything else about uh, the kind of work that'll be there, and then we can maybe start a, a little more in the beginning? Okay. Um, this is my cat Zopelote. Oh, um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, the show goes until it's for two months. It goes until July twenty third, and um, I'm also giving a gallery talk on the day after the opening, the twenty eighth at Saturday at noon, and another one July the second at noon and I've been growing all these little seeds of different cactuses and things and I'm gonna be giving them away to anyone that comes to the talks cause I love to give away plants. I gave you some. <laughs> yeah, I uh, got it. I've got um, so many different succulents and, uh, and I'm just so thrilled. I've got this little window where they all sit and they're all uh, doing very well. I, I was surprised I usually don't do so well. They do well if you don't water them too much, like because they like the roots like to be dried out and get oxygen. So I have about 35 pieces in the show, and I have a whole lot of new pieces that I've done that are really connected to this area, to New Mexico, uh, to the flora and fauna, and a lot of paintings about relationships and uh, mortality. And I also have a few older pieces that I've done that I really love too much to sell when I first did them. So now I feel like I can put them in the show and sell them. So I have many different sizes of pieces. I also have pieces that are made out of bones and porcupine quills. And I like to make pieces with tiny bones that I get out of owl pellets. And then and then like an owl pellet is when they when an owl catches a mouse or something, they can't digest the fur and the teeth and the bones. So they cough it up 
and the next day, kind of like a cat with a hairball, and it's this beautiful little thing, and you dissect them, and you get tiny bones, and so I thought it would be fun to make women that are very alluring, but when you get up close, it's made out of dead mice bones, so it's kind of a funny thing, like people are not always as they seem, so yeah, it's going to be a fun show. There's a lot of different things in it, so. And that's uh, May 27th at Evoke. You uh you were born on the border of South Texas and Mexico along the Rio Grande. And uh, maybe we could just start there and you could tell us a little back background about who you are so uh, okay. people kind of get to know you more intimately. Okay. Yeah, um, my dad was a farmer. Actually, all the men in my family, all my grandfathers, they were all farmers. And uh, he grew... Um, cabbage and onions and my mom even wrote a book on an onion cookbook so we were that was a lot a big part of our childhood we would be out at the farm and the farm was right on the Rio Grande River so when as little kids we would swim across the river and it was pretty it was very different there right now there's definitely a lot of sadness on the border but when I was little growing up there there was a lot more free back and forth kind of exchange and we spent a lot of time in Mexico we had friends across the border. And so I spent a lot of time growing up in, in back and forth there. And it's it kind of heart, heartbreaking what's happening now on the border. But um, there's still a lot of um, beautiful things about that area. It's wild. There's huge alligator gars in the Rio Grande. There's amazing wildlife there and giant blue indigo snakes that I had a cousin that was always bringing home these giant snakes. And carrying them around the farm. And so I got, I got a real interest in wild things when I was little and spent a lot of time on the farm, definitely. And I had a father that was, my dad like never liked the idea of buying toys. He was really into like having the kids make their own fun. And, and like when we were, one, one Christmas, he, he didn't, wasn't into presents, but I remember one year, this giant tr truck came from the farm and it, and it went into, the backyard and it dumped all this carrot dirt, which is this really deep, beautiful, rich earth. And, and, and he was like, Merry Christmas. And we were like, my brother and sister and I like, what? But it turned out to be this amazing present because we planted like, we made little valleys and little villages and we planted seeds. So we grew like little tangerine orchards and things like that. And it kept growing and we built little things in it. And so things like that, that happened when I was little, I can see how it kind of sparked creativity as a little kid, not to have store-bought toys. And um, as you know, my sister went, my parents, my dad was a farmer and my mom was a school teacher, but we both went into the arts. My sister is a film director, Catherine Hardwick, and I've been you know, doing art my whole life. So it's kind of funny that some of the things that happened when we were little, I can see later, make sense. You've yeah. lived in uh, many different places since, right? Uh, before you ended up in Santa Fe, uh, you had lived in Latin America? Yeah, when, when I was a little kid, I always was interested in like the Amazon jungle and I was reading about it and my sister and I shared a bedroom, but when she went off to college, I painted all the walls of my bedroom. This little room was just covered with jungle plants and birds and animals and insects from the jungle. And I just wanted more than anything to go there. I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to go to the Amazon. And so I couldn't figure out how I could do that. But when I was a senior in high school, I found out about this exchange student program that I could like get there for three months and live with the family. And I knew that if I could get there to Brazil, I would stay and I would like not come home for a long time. I would get jobs doing various things. So I did that and I ended up in Brazil and I was down in Rio with this family. And then I learned Portuguese and I was teaching English to little kids and teaching swimming. And then I made my way up the coast and I got, I got to Belém, which is the mouth of the Amazon river. And there's all these old wooden cargo boats where you'd sleep with all this cargo, you'd sleep with these in these big hammocks. And I, convinced them to give, let me ride on one. And I rode down the Amazon, incredible experience. I was 17 at the time and it was just life-changing experience. And I got to Manaus, which is the capital of Amazonas. And there was a family that I, the family I stayed with in Rio had like some old relatives they hadn't seen in years, but I had their address. So it was this tiny little, very, very simple little house. And I got there and it was amazing because they had a daughter, they had about five kids and the daughter, my age, 17, had just died of some rare disease. And so they felt like I was some 
apparition coming <laughs> like like coming back to their life and so I ended up taking care of their kids and living with them for a long time and eventually decided to go home and I wanted to only go by land so I went through Venezuela kind of getting ride through the jungle on with truck drivers some difficult <laughs> wild situations there but then I got up to Venezuela and I finally ended up coming home through Colombia and Central America and coming back home and then I ended up in Austin Texas I went to college finally and I uh, it was really fun it was right when the punk scene was very alive and vibrant and I I, I joined an all-girl punk band and I was the lead singer and we had so much fun and we traveled around Texas doing that and then I ended up going to graduate school in New York so I was in New York for about eight years and um, then I just wanted to move back to the wilderness it was just too much <laughs> to be in a city all the time have you been following the case of Stephen Donzinger, um, the uh, lawyer for the Amazonian tribe that was uh, put on house arrest by Chevron? Yeah, he finally uh, just got out of his house arrest and I think is free now. Oh, but no. um, he was defending an Am Amazonian tribe and Chevron used their influence to, you know, kind of unduly prosecute him. And uh, he's just now, uh, last week was, or earlier this week was released from house arrest. Well, I didn't know that. I'm going to have to look it up. I did yeah, not it's know. A, it's a fascinating story and he's a remarkable guy. So I, I thought maybe you'd um, love that. Uh, but also, I guess I should ask you, what was the name of the all female punk band that we you were, did lead? You were called The Poems. F -O the Poems. Yeah. And we, uh, we made our own costumes and we, um, don't look us up. <laughs> Somebody from England just called and said they wanted to do like a, a remake of some of our records. We were, we, we went up the Texas top 10, but this gives you an idea of what we were like. We were called charmingly incompetent. So like I was the, probably the worst singer of the group, but I had the energy to do it. And so I got to change with the drummer. Sometimes I got to play the drums, which I loved, but the drum kit went all over the stage, but we would make things. It was really creative. Like we made giant ducks out of paper mache and we'd ride them out on stage. And we had a little oven, a toy oven, and we would bake cakes on stage. And it was kind of fun. It was really fun. <laughs> so and that was in New York. That was in Austin. Oh, in Austin. Yeah. Cool. And then, so you're in New York, you're like, I've got to get out of here. And yeah. does that become the move to Santa Fe from there or? No, no, I actually eloped with somebody that didn't, wasn't the right one to elope with. <laughs> and then, and then I ended up in kind of rural Connecticut and I met the person who I'm with right now. My cat's going crazy. He's like, he acts like, it sounds like a turkey flying around. So he wants to be on this, he's zooming. <laughs> so. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, so I, uh, we, we ended up moving to Central Oregon and we decided we wanted to live really close to the earth and off the grid. So we, we bought this little cabin and it was really right in a, a mule deer a winter range. So you'd have a lot of wildlife. It was pretty beautiful, but the cabin was tiny. And so we had to add on to it with, uh, we did it with Ecrete, which is this um, ash, pumice, and stone. So it's, it's fireproof because there was a lot of fires there. And so that was a very, we lived there for about 14 years. And just, we just had solar panels and backup generators and um, an inverter that inverts the solar energy into power. And I always thought that it, it was such a great metaphor kind of for being an artist because like in some ways, you know, you're in your studio and some days don't go all that well. And nobody really cares if you're making what you're making, if you're writing whatever song, whatever thing. In a way, it's like has to be totally self-generated. Like you have to be able to build your own fires. And so being off the grid, getting so used to the idea that like you you have to have the sun. And when the sun is there, the, there's too much sun Sundays and it stores it in the batteries. And then you have this battery pack, these beautiful red batteries. That's kind of like a metaphor for when you get ideas when you're writing or writing music or making making art, you write, you've got ideas, you write them down on everything, you sketchbooks, whatever. And then you have a day that's like kind of bleak and you're like, what am I gonna make? What am I gonna do? And then you look and you have your like battery pack and you, cause you have to build your own fires. I mean, I, I've always felt that way that you've got to figure out how to, no matter what people are gonna do, you have to be able to do it. And so living off the grid reminded me of that. Plus it was fun to have, a life where you didn't have to depend on electricity. We were way out in the country and you didn't have to have 
the power. Other neighbors that live down the road, their power would go out. And, you know, we usually had power, not always, but it, it was a, it was an interesting way to live. But it was also, I loved being way out in the wilderness and seeing wildlife all the time. But the one dark thing about it was there was a lot of people that were doing bad things with wildlife. And if somebody needs to hunt to eat, I totally respect that. But there was people that would hunt and trap animals for a negative thing. So, you know, just for their own purposes, for the, for the skins or for a trophy. And so I was exposed to a lot of that. And I got involved with a group called Trap Free Oregon. And we really tried to fight trapping of wild animals because um, it can also hurt people's dogs and other things like that. And um, we fought it for a long time. Amazingly, New Mexico just passed the trap for, tra trapping law, anti-trapping law, which is so exciting because that's such an important thing. And um, so I've always been really interested in wildlife. And after, after there, we moved to Arizona, different things took us, different either job possibilities or things took us. Lived in Arizona, wild javelinas running around, saguaro cactuses. There's so much more to say, but we ended Oh, wait, up wait, what are javelinas? Those are the little pigs? Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're kind of related, but they're, they're wild and they're furry and some people call them peccaries and they go around in packs. They have a really neat smell. Some people don't like it, but I like it. You can smell them when they're coming and they'll, they, if you put out water there, you can like attract them into your yard. We lived right, right near in this little village called Picture Rocks, which is right near Saguaro National Park. And so you would just lift up barbed wire and you could walk into the park. And it was amazing. We had road runners and bobcats and um, it was very exciting. And I got into putting out a camera to photograph wildlife just to see who comes around at night because a lot of these are nocturnal and you don't see them all the time. Um, but then um, my husband had an opportunity for a job in Maine. And so we ended up moving to Maine and we lived in this little apartment in an old lighthouse. And that was a whole nother <laughs> amazing experience and um, ended up getting very involved in doing a lot of paintings and studying about seals and sea lions and all the sea life and kayaking in the ocean. And that was kind of incredible. But then we had to move out of there and move to a little island, Mount Desert Island. And the first week we were there, we saw a hurt porcupine on the road and we were like, we got to save it. And I found a number for a wildlife re rehab place and it turned out to be really nearby. And so we drove over there and I ended up working there. It was a great place. They would have all these, the first day I had to like give a shot to the porcupine and there was all these things happening with people bringing in little bobcats and, you know, ravens and just to be there and to try to help animals in a really real way was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> God, that's amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, I had no idea you were also in Maine for a time. So uh, from Maine, is that what brings you to Santa Fe finally? Yes, yes. Um, I, a lot of reasons, but, but one, one just big reason was just missing being in the West, missing the, the multicultures. Wayne, Maine is beautiful, but it's very kind of cold and wet and white. And I grew up, you know, on the border. My husband is of Italian descent and, and, and they were just wanting to be in a place that was more connected. There's my cat. <laughs> just want, <laughs> wanting to be in a place that was more diverse. And also um, in terms of art, I, I had for years, all the places that I lived, I ended up when I was living in Oregon, we would, I had a gallery in New York and Chicago and Santa Monica. So we would drive my paintings in a little truck all the way across the country for these shows. <laughs> and, and I would be like sleeping in these little motels with one eye open, worried about my paintings out in the trailer. And so um, I thought it would be amazing to move to a city like Santa Fe that had galleries and a lot of museums and a lot of art so that I could, you know, hopefully show my work here. And I was really excited to get into this gallery and I love being in a place with a lot of artists and, and musicians and out of a lot of different cultures it reminds me a lot more of where I grew up and I grew up on the on the Rio Grande and now you know we're right near the Rio Grande so it's kind of connecting and a lot of the same birds and things live here the white winged doves and different things that I grew up seeing and animals and insects things like that. So you and I just seem to connect right away. And I got to give th a big thanks to the author, Christina Vo, who introduced us and we went over to your place for lunch. And I just love your studio. You have a beautiful home and you really seem to know how to live. Um, 
I think the greenhouse was uh, the recent addition. So maybe we could start there. Yes, we when we first wanted to move here, um, our budget was not really Santa Fe budget. It was out of town more. But then my sister, I told her we were going to move here. And she was like, I love Santa Fe. Let's go in together and get a place together. So we decided to do that. And it's worked out well because I have room to have a studio and I and, and still be you know close enough in town. Um, um, but yeah, yeah, Christina, uh, oh, I actually am doing a painting about her that's going to be in the show. It's called Christina and the Sun Bear, because when I found out she was Vietnamese, well, my favorite bear of all the bears is the sun bear. And I got very excited painting about it. I have it somewhere. Give you a little view of it over here. It's not quite finished. It's all covered in words. It's really detailed. So it's been fun trying to paint her and research a lot about the plants and fruits and birds and everything of Vietnam. And they have these amazing centipedes there. They're incredible. And in fact, they're, I think the third, the fourth leg turns into a penis or something. They're very strange <laughs> creatures. Um, but yeah, so we moved here and then COVID hit like two weeks later. And so we thought it'd be so good if we could grow our own vegetables. And we had this, just this area of dirt. And so my husband who's worked in architecture, architectural design for years, um, he went to the historic committee. We did it on Zoom and got permission to build a greenhouse. And it's been amazing because we grow, as you saw, we grow all of our own vegetables in it, almost all of them. And um, we also, I got really into collecting seeds from agave, soap tree yucca, banana yucca, everything that I can find. And lately I've been getting like honey locust, uh, catalpa, um, datura, different seeds like that and planting them. So I have all these little ones. And it's so amazing because the seed is like, also kind of a metaphor for artists and ideas because that tiny little seed, it looks like just like a speck of dirt usually. And that can become, if you take care of it and you nurture it, it can become like a whole tree and give you fruit. And I feel that way about ideas. Like sometimes I'll have an idea and I'll be falling asleep and I won't write it down. And then you lose that. You lose that little seed that could have been a really cool project or something. And so I, I try to always have a pencil with me everywhere because you never know what you might hear somebody say something in a cafe or whatever, something you see can spark such a great idea. So I love planting seeds and um, yeah, I, <laughs> it's fun to see agave. I planted agave and two years ago I planted some and they're like this big, but they're growing and they already have little spines. So it's fun. Well, Irene, this is the show where we talk about movies, and luckily for us, you recently finished five paintings for Guillermo del Toro's Netflix series, Cabinet of Curiosities, which will be out in the fall. And uh, the production designer, Tamara Deverell, was nominated for an Academy Award on Nightmare Alley, and she ended up licensing some of your drawings and paintings. So for those of you who've seen Nightmare Alley, um, Oh, I'm sorry. They're not in Nightmare Alley, but she, because uh, she liked your work, she optioned them for Cabinet of Curiosities. And the episode it's in will be Dreams in the Witch House based on the H.P. Lovecraft story. Yeah, it's actually, it wasn't Tamar that, Tamara that saw them first. Um, um, so the, pro the series is so exciting, partly because I love Guillermo del Toro. He's one of my favorite directors. I love Pan's Labyrinth, seen it a million times. I love Shape of Water, uh, and I love who he is. Like hearing his interviews is so interesting. He's such a fascinating person, and the way he grew up in Mexico and the way that he translates childhood experiences into his movies is beautiful to hear him speak about it. So what ha what happened is he decided to do this um, Netflix show, and um, he he hired different directors. I think it's eight different episodes, and he hired different directors to each direct a different episode. I think he's directing one or two, and then the others. And he hired my sister, Catherine Hardwick, to direct one. And they were doing a Zoom, and she has a few of my paintings. And he saw them. I think this is how she explained it. He saw some of them, and one of the characters in the show is an artist. And so it turned out that he wanted to use my work for it, which was super exciting. And they didn't want to use my actual paintings. They wanted me to paint big triangular paintings, like four of them that put together and fit into a huge triangle, kind of a challenge. And um, and then after, so so they, I'll tell you about that in a second. But then after that, uh, I sent them up to Toronto where they were filming. 
so many things are filming in Toronto all the time now. And I sent them up there and they decided, wait, we want one more the big triangle one, something else. And so it, they're really part of the story, which is so fascinating. It's a really scary, strange, beautiful story. And then uh, uh, Tamara called me and she said, actually, we want pictures in your studio. We want pictures of other paintings and we want to license permission to use them. So we'll reproduce them. And the, 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 the studio is amazing because she's in this old, old house, kind of like the Salem Witch House. And she's in this attic room as her studio, all these triangular angles and then all these triangular paintings. And then they took a lot of my other paintings, some of which I don't even have anymore have been sold. And they turned them into triangles and different weird shapes. And then they want, they licensed a lot of my drawings. I always get ideas and I draw them and then they turn into parts of paintings. And so they licensed those and they ended up using like 28 drawings and about 20 paintings. And so they turned it into this studio that's like the most amazing studio of the, of the character. And um, it was pretty exciting. It also came in handy because, you know, I needed, I was struggling. I hadn't sold a painting in a while. So it was a way to make some money and just completely exciting to be involved in that project. And the funny thing about it, this is what I was going to tell you, the funny thing about it, two of the paintings had to be two characters that are in the movie and they had to be half alive and half dead. And I, that is right up my alley because I have been, as you can see, I have one that I started here where her body is like a skeleton. I have, um, well, I have, I, it's, it's a theme I'm interested in because I, I, uh, after I lost like my parents, I felt this feeling of like, wow, when you lose somebody that you love that you can't bear to lose, you have to be able to like become even more alive because you're it's like, it, it sparks something in you and you realize the clock is ticking. Like I, I can't waste a single day. We only get this one 24 hours. And so, so I started doing these paintings where, yeah, you're, you're, you're sad because you lost somebody you can't bear to lose. You're underground. The worms are eating your bones and, you know, cleaning your bones and everything. But the other part of you has to have almost even more arms and doing more, almost like a wild octopus to do everything you want to do before it's your time to go under and make the great disappearance, you know? And so, so when they gave me the assignment, I read what they wanted the paintings to look like. I couldn't believe that they wanted a half, they wanted it to be cut in half where you'd see the skeleton from here. But I said, can I do it? So the lower part of the body is actually in the ground subterranean. So you see worms and all kinds of things like eating it. So they're really dark and really beautiful. And my sister said that actors were really surprised seeing the paintings of themselves with their lower body dead and eaten, <laughs> skeletonized. Oh, I love that. It's kind of got a picture of Dorian Gray quality to it. Uh, yeah, it does. And Nightmare Alley was amazing. Wow. Did you see it? Yeah, I did. I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was, you know, I guess every uh, great director has to do their kind of ode to Fellini's eight and a half. Yeah. And I, I just love Guillermo. Uh, I met him uh, yes. in Telluride when he was there with Shape of Water. And he was just about the nicest guy. Oh, I love that you met him. <laughs> yeah, you and him? and he was he was so personable. The way it happened is they had his world premiere of Shape of Water so late at night. It started at 10 or started oh. at 930, you know, it didn't get out till 1130 or midnight. Yeah. And he said, uh, as he introduced it, he said, OK, there's not going to be a Q&A for this. But if you want to talk about the movie at 7 a.m. tomorrow, I'll be in the park like a homeless person and I'll, I'll buy you all coffee. And so I love that. we all got up early and got down to uh, go meet him. And he, he was just uh, really a darling and genuine person. Oh, how wonderful. Like, like about how many people came? Oh, uh, maybe 12. Uh, there's a photo on, uh, on Instagram. I'll send it to you so you can see it was I'll check it out. Just a little group of us. And we were all, um, having coffee with Guillermo that morning. That's and, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, y your work is so perfect for the artists in the Guillermo del Toro show that um, I, I think it's it's such a good fit. They probably he probably thought the same thing. And I guess death is a reoccurring theme. Um, we love on the show to talk about death anytime we get a chance. <laughs> um, and so it's mortality, it's it's bones, it's dirt, it's un subterranean. Um, please take us there. <laughs> um, 
So I, for a long time, I've been thinking how, how amazing it would be if you could uh, leap forward and your skeleton, your dead self could come talk to you now. And, and instead of like being on your deathbed and wishing what you hadn't done, if you could just like leap forward and have that skeleton yourself come talk to you and be asking you like, hey, are you doing what you really wanna be doing? Is this really, are you really on the right path? Hey, do you owe somebody an apology or you know whatever? Just like making you think of leaping forward to being already dead. And I think it also sparks something so stimulating, kind of like I was saying before, if you, if you have, if you are in contact with and you're thinking of those kind of things, rather than it making you sad, like some people don't want to talk about it, I actually think it's enlivening. It makes your life way more even alive and it sparks it with incredible enthusiasm because you know that you know you don't have you don't have forever. And so it actually I get a little bit into a trance thinking about it. Sometimes when I'm working and I'm thinking it's like I wake up and I can't wait to go in my studio because I'm like this, this 24 hours, this is it. And I've got these ideas I have to get down. And sometimes I have so many ideas that I can't, like right now I've had to stop making new, starting new paintings because I have this show and I have to finish some of the ones I'm working on. But I, I do think that the idea of thinking about mortality and one of the ones, actually it's right here because I'm working on it. This one, she's getting into her coffin and I, <laughs> it's not quite finished, but I like the idea that she has shoes on almost like a little girl in a way also, because it's kind of like, um, I read, well, I read this book and it's called A Buried Alive and it's all, it's fascinating. It's all about people that accidentally throughout history were buried alive. Like sometimes people had catalepsy and they didn't know it. So they would bury them alive. There's a museum of mummies, amazing museum in Guanajuato, Mexico. And it is all people that either when they had to, the, the people couldn't pay for their relatives, they would dig them up and they naturally mummify the gases in the earth there. But some of them had been buried alive. So you see them in poses like trying to get out of the coffin. And so they ended up developing coffins where you could have like a little bell, you could have a little ringer. And so I was thinking, well, what if you have in your coffin what you would want? So if you're gonna, and then I thought, the questions, there's um, a lot of my paintings have writing in it, Mo most of them do. So I thought it's gonna talk about like what, okay, before you get in the coffin. So it's the same kind of thing, like projecting forward. And then I was thinking about, I've always done a lot of paintings dealing with this subject, but, but I was really thinking about how people that I've seen die, I don't wanna go that way. Like, I don't wanna go in the hospital and die. I don't wanna be like in some sad situation. I wanna go by the natural world. Like if I'm out hiking and a cougar gets me, I'd rather be food for the natural world. They've given me so much and I love the idea of connecting with nature. And so I started researching every creature in the world and every plant and every snake, every reptile, everything that kills you. And so I did a painting, it's called Disappearing by Nature. It's down here, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see it. So, so it's covered with writing and it's covered with research. Sorry, I'm cutting her head off somehow. That's okay. If if you're listening at home, um, this is a, <laughs> got some yellow green. It's a a nude uh, character with a snake wrapped around her. So so it's all all the words. If you come to the show, you'll see it, or it's on my website too. But all the words are talking about everywhere in the world the most poisonous of things because my you hardly ever hear about someone dying by something in nature. But to me, I would so much rather die that way than like in a bed in a hospital. And so I read about this, the one that's the most intriguing right now is this, this uh, blue ringed octopus. It's like the size of a tangerine. It's little, it's tiny, it's not gonna bite you. But if you're swimming near it and you reach out to touch it and it thinks you're gonna bother it, all the little rings light up like it's a little light show underwater. And then, and then it will bite you and there's no pain because it has, it has a deadening venom in it, but you die in 13 minutes. And it has enough venom to kill like 26 men. And so I thought, if you knew that you were like getting really old, you could go swimming near it. It's in Australia. And you could have some of your old friends with you. You could all be swimming. And it would be a way to have nature take you rather than. And then there's also things locally like Datura. There's a lot of poisonous things everywhere. But um, I, I think that the idea of going by nature. So that's why it's called disappearing by nature. Because I find that a way to think about it. Um, it's kind of funny, but it's also interesting to read how many things are so deadly. 
Now, you do a lot of hiking here in the Sangre de Cristos. Um, can you yeah. tell me a little bit about that and how long you like to go for the trails you're into? Yeah, I, I, I love to go hiking. If I'm not in my studio, I'm usually, I'm usually out hiking. And um, um, I love to go. Like, there's a lot of places that we like to go, like um, Bandelier has some great hikes and uh, uh, Galisteo Basin and Valles de Caldera. But I also love to go just up the road, heading towards the mountain up here. And I guess it's Hyde Park Road that leads you up. There's all those Kasuki trails off different sides. And uh, we found us way up in the mountains there. We, one day we found a spring and we put a trail camera by it. So we go, we, you get to see like the animals that wander unseen. You know, like when you go hiking during the day, you might see a, a couple of squirrels, maybe a tassel-eared squirrel, which are really cool with the little tassels but you rarely see like big mammals. You rarely see bears or things like that. So you put a camera out and then you see everything who's wandering unseen, you know, like you might never see them, but they're out there at night wandering along. And so we get ringtails and uh, bears with cubs and bobcats. And uh, it's just even, even long tail, uh, black tail jackrabbits in the forest, which I always thought of them in the desert more. But so we spend a lot of time up there and it's so fun because you put the camera and then you go back like, you know, maybe a week later, and it's like, who was there? Who was, who came here? And, and one time the bear actually knocked the camera off and like into the spring and you could see, you could see the video of him, his head right there in the camera. And so that's something that I really, we, we do a lot of, and it, and it inspired something. I had this feeling of like, I wish that I could pet these creatures, like ringtails are beautiful little creatures with striped tails, but you never get close to them. You usually don't even see them. So one night I was asleep and my cat was right next to me, Lucini, and I was petting him. And I just had this feeling like, hey, this cat is like a portal that transports me and lets me pet all those creatures. I felt like I'm petting a bear, I'm petting a bobcat. And I felt like that cat suddenly became, and your dog could do this for you. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like you're sort of asleep, it's sort of lucid dreaming, and there, there you are petting your own pet. And you could be petting all of those. So I, I did a painting about that, which, want me to go get it? No, no. Um, okay. I'll have to see it uh, when you have me over for lunch again. Okay. And I'll come to uh, the show. <laughs> yeah, that. Oh, yeah. You're right. I'll come see it at the show. That's May 27th at Evoke. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did want to bring up what a fun lunch that was. And uh, the food was really spectacular. It was all vegetarian. And so you were a uh, complete vegetarian. How long uh, have you been doing that? Well, I, I was, I, I try not to be too strict about anything because sometimes it's so annoying for other people if they're feeding you. But I, what, I was, when we lived in Oregon, I was a, a raw vegan for about 15 years. And, and I, I felt really good doing it, but I do notice that socially people get really, it, it sometimes causes, it causes more friction. So I'm, I'm a little bit more relaxed about it, but when I'm choosing what I'm gonna eat by myself, I tend to go mostly for plant-based almost all plant-based things like that and um but but in new mexico i mean i just love the chilies <laughs> i love i love the i love having bringing that into everything that i eat as much as i can and um yeah it's amazing living here yeah i think growing your own food um being conscious about sh what you eat then also being in the outdoors i think that kind of all those things really put together who you are in a certain way. And then you also have this relationship th to animals and life and death through your art. So I don't know, I guess I don't really have a question there, but um, it, it, it kind of paints a really complete picture for me of who you are. Hmm. So Let's see. Uh, is there going to be food at Evoke on the twenty uh, seventh of May? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but when you were talking about what you just said about all those things, thank you for that. Was kind of a nice sum up. But I, 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 I really love that term re rewilding and the idea of, um, like they talk about rewilding different parts of the natural world, like bringing the wilderness back and the habitat, creating better habitat. But I also love the idea of rewilding our hearts. Like, I think sometimes it's really easy to get so involved in things that are mechanical and, you know, digitized. And I feel like there's something about, you know, being out in nature that can just like transport you, like no matter how bad of a day or situation you're in in your life, when you're out in the wilderness, it really, um, 
it always makes you feel better and connects you to something that we need. I always feel like we need all species which with, with which we share this earth. And sometimes I have neighbors that want to kill skunks or whatever. And I'm like, are you kidding? You're so, we're so lucky. Like that one smell of beautiful skunk, it connects you to the wilderness and to the wild. And, and if so, what, if you have a centipede, don't kill it, like maybe study it, figure out a way that you can connect with it. And, and I just feel like all those experiences, I love reading about wildlife because it kind of brings you into a way of, it makes you happy. It makes you happy to think of like just the weird ways that they mate. Just the other day, I was reading that the black bears that we have right here in New Mexico, um, which also come in cinnamon color, blonde, brown, and black. But they, the female, when she's having her baby, she makes what's called like a babysitter tree. She'll find a really big tree, deciduous tree with lots of branches. She'll take her cubs up there and while she's going to look for food and they'll all be out on the branches. And sometimes you can, you know that you see one because you'll see like little scat from all the bears around the tree. But I never heard of that babysitter tree. So now when I'm out in the woods, I'm like babysitter tree. And then you know that they've been up there. It's exciting. <laughs> um, have you heard of Ned Ludd um, or a, what a Luddite is? I I feel like it's a familiar word, but I don't know. Yeah, he was, I think it was in the 1800s. He was replaced at his job by some new technology. Oh. And so there's this kind of uh, movement of these old guys mostly who, um, who are against technology. And so their email will be something like Ned Ludd 21 at... <laughs> um, maybe... So they have email, they have email. <laughs> yeah. And so maybe uh, when we talk a little bit more, we can unpack uh, the life of Ned Ludd next time. Okay. Um, you have a lot in your brain. I listen to your interviews. You, get, you have a big brain. With, you read a lot. I can tell you a re real reader. Right? Thanks. Um, well, I, I do my best. I picked up a copy of uh, that natalie goldberg book uh writing down the bones and I, I haven't opened that up yet and then i've got uh my friend jamie mcgrath morris's um autobi or biography of tony hillerman and i'm looking forward to reading that but i, I yeah i think the there's just so many cool authors here that it's fun to be able to read their books and then have them on the show yeah that's great i think what by the way i just think it's great that, that you do this show because you 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 bring people out and and I listen to things and I'm, I'm like it's sort of like you see a much fuller picture and it sparks a lot of ideas and I think it's great that you're doing it. How long Thanks. have you been doing it? Uh, just about a year, um, maybe a little more. We started in February of last year, mm -hmm. and uh, we've done fifty some episodes at this point. That's a <laughs> but, lot. Yeah, and you know that really flew by but that's a show irene so great thank you <laughs> yeah i'll do a little uh outro for you um everybody this was irene hardwick olivieri and you can see her work at evoke gallery on may the 27th and what's the title of the show irene it's called seduction by centipede and the show opens from five to seven but it's going to be up for two months so yeah, get down to Evoke uh, at the end of May, starting May 27th, and check out Seduction by Centipede by uh, Irene Hard Hardwick Olivieri. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, by Irene Hardwick Olivieri. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm going to end it now. Wait, I'm going to stop recording.